This is the Project Management Podcast. We bring project management topics to beginners and experts. Find us on the web at www.thepmpodcast.com or send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com. Hello and welcome to episode number 134. I am Cornelius Fichtner. This is the Project Management Podcast for the 11th of December 2009. Nice to have you with us. Communication is a critical but often overlooked component of successful project management. This means that we project managers must strive to become better communicators. But you cannot do that just by reading the Bimbok Guide. It takes years and years of practice. Well, enter Bill Dow and Bruce Taylor. Together, they have over 60 years of project management experience and practice, and so they decided to write the Project Management Communications Bible. It contains many tools, techniques, and best practices in the area of project communications that you need to successfully execute projects, keep your team and customers fully apprised, and deliver crucial information in a timely manner. In our interview today, we will be looking at the top reasons for communications failure on projects. But before we get to that, I would first like to thank all those of you who have taken time to answer the 2009 Project Management Podcast Listener Survey. It has given me valuable insight into what it is that you, the listeners, want to hear. For instance, most of you don't want me to change the intro music. You would like to hear more about risk management and soft skills. The majority of you prefers if the episodes are 30 minutes maximum in duration. And you want to hear book reviews and product reviews. These are just a small number of items that help me a lot in understanding how to develop the program. And if you remember last week's episode, it was the first product review created because so many of you have asked for that. Thank you for telling me through this survey. Everyone who participated in the survey was automatically entered into a drawing for three prizes and the winners have already been notified. And as soon as I hear back from them, I will announce their names here on the program. And now, on to our interview, or rather, on to the announcement that we have a book giveaway with the interview. Bill and Bruce are the authors of the Project Management Communications Bible and we are giving away two copies of that book book. One copy goes to the listeners of our premium podcast and there is nothing that you have to do if you are a listener to that. You're automatically entered. If you are listening to the free version of the podcast, then all you have to do is send an email to pmpodcast at gmail.com. In the subject line, write the word Bible. After all, this is for the Project Management Communications Bible. Send it to me by December 21st, 2000 nine and you're good to go. That's all it takes. And now the interview. Bruce Taylor is an expert in the field of project management with more than 40 years of experience. Bruce regularly provides professional assistant to top management and has accumulated impressive experience in developing project scheduling and cost control systems. He was responsible for the scheduling and resource leveling of many huge North Sea oil platforms, including Thistle and Brent B and C, each of these worth about 5 billion US dollars. Bill Dow is a published author and PMP with more than 20 years in information technology, specializing in software development and project management. Bill has a strong passion for project management, project management offices and software development lifecycle methodologies. Bill has a strong methodology background. He's been very successful in every company he has worked for in ensuring that the project methodologies match the projects while still guaranteeing the highest quality for the customer. Enjoy the interview. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview Today with Bill Dow and Bruce Taylor authors of the Project Management Communications Bible. Oh, 
Hello, Bruce, and hello, Bill, and welcome to the Project Management Podcast. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. This is Bruce. Glad to have you guys. Glad to have you guys. Well, we want to talk about a survey, in particular a 2007 PMI survey, which claimed that there are nine main reasons why projects fail. But before we go into these nine reasons, I'd like to know a little bit more about this survey here. Uh, and, and in particular, I'd like to know, you know, what's the title of the survey and, and who conducted it? Which one of you can, can speak to that? I, I can take it. I'm actually looking at it right now. This okay. is Bill Dow. Um, the title was called The Top Nine Causes for Project Failure. And it was actually conducted by the Computer Technology Industry Association out in Oak Brook, Terrence, Illinois. Um, it was conducted in January 2007. Mm -hmm. There was 1,007 respondents. And actually, PMI put it in their July 2007 PMI Network magazine. Ah, so that's where I thought it was a PMI survey. Okay, yes. thanks, yeah. thanks for correcting me there. Yeah. All right, what was the goal of that survey? I think the goal basically was to determine from a variety of project managers why projects fail. Okay. Have you have you f found out if there's anything newer, uh, ever any anything since then? Um, no, actually, um, I think right now this is the latest. Um, I do a continuous look on the internet, and this is really the latest survey that's out there. Okay. Well, and I I also think that you know it doesn't really matter whether you do it in in the 80s or the 90s. The the reasons why projects fail they are probably usually the same, and they're not gonna be jumping all over the board back and forth anyway, right? Right. Yeah. So what is the difference then between this particular survey here and, you know, when you read in the Internet, there's always this statement that, that 70 percent, 80 percent, 90 percent of all IT projects fail continuously. And there they usually state that this is coming from the chaos report. And the chaos report, obviously, that's the one that's uh, done by the Standish group regularly. So mm -hmm. what is the difference between those two? Yeah, so it's an old, that, that report was done back in 1986. And as you know, a lot of things have changed uh, since then. Um, but there is actually a lot of similarities as well. So, for example, in the chaos report, they talk about uh, incomplete project requirements and specs. And in, uh, in this survey, the top nine reasons survey, it says poor project requirements. Another example is lack of resources. Um, in, uh, in one survey, insignificant resource planning was in another survey. So in the end, they're pretty much similar. I think the top nine survey um, is really giving you a little bit more of updated figures and updated numbers and what PMs are thinking about today. Okay. Okay. So why then is this survey, the, the 2007 version, why is this in particular important to the two of you? Um, I can take that one, <clears throat> mainly because it verifies uh, the reason why we wrote the book in the first place. Is, right. uh, we found a lacking in the communication portion of the knowledge areas in, in all projects, basically, and that people weren't paying attention to it that much. And it turns out that it, it's, uh, it justified and, and gave us a reason, uh, in a way, not exactly why we wrote the book, but it, um, it verified our assumption that communication was a very, very important part of managing a project. And as it turned out, from over a thousand uh, project managers, they also think, think that as well. Okay, cool. Well, you've already started with uh, with one of the the reasons why projects fail their communication. So why why don't we jump right into the survey, and we're going to do this uh, backwards. So we're not going to start with the number one issue that why reasons a reason why projects fails, but we're going to start with number nine. Well, according to this survey, obviously. And what we're going <laughs> to do is we're going to you know flip flop between the two of you. Sure. And we're going to take a look at uh, what you have to say about uh, these. And maybe you could, you know, for each one of those nine items, give a general tip shot, tip on what the listeners, all project managers obviously can do in order to avoid these, uh, these issues on their project. So top down or bottom up rather, <laughs> we have uh, number nine, and that is lack of control and change processes. Why don't we start with Bill? Why don't you yeah. do that? 
Great. Thank you. Yeah, the change control process is a major communication tool that we identified in the book. Uh, the change control process, as you can imagine, is critical from the beginning of the project. And it really allows project managers to communicate what's being changed on the project. So to avoid any kind of communication issues, project managers will create this project as part of their kickoffs. Okay. Okay. So that that's also your recommendation. Yeah. Make sure def- make sure that you do this as part of your kickoff, that you have change control processes in place as you're launching your project. So think about this before you even start the project. In other right. Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well then, uh, number eight, uh, Bruce. Why don't you take that one? It's insufficient or no risk planning. That's an interesting one. Yes, it is. Uh, one of the major factors in a success or failure of any project is the difference between being reactive compared to being proactive. And when team members or other stakeholders perform a risk planning or risk analysis, it provides them with a major advantage in being proactive on their projects. A risk analysis of the project bonds the project team or any group that's getting together and going through the risks that are possible on a project. The communication among the team members is heightened significantly when you do this. And on most projects, or just about every project I've ever worked on, when we did a risk analysis, it was amazing how the team members, almost every single team member walking away from a a risk session like that, uh, commenting to the fact that they didn't realize the project was as risky as they had originally thought. When they went through the analysis, it brought out some risks that they weren't aware of, and consequently, it turns out that most people think that after they've done it, that the the projects that they're working on are uh, Mm risk-prone. The projects that I led most of my life are are usually small and medium-sized projects, so there's not really all too much budget there to go through a total risk analysis at the beginning. But what what I used to do, and I found this quite a, a good way of getting the risks always to the forefront of the people who I worked with, is I had sort of the top five or six risks that I had identified for this uh, project, and I put mm-hmm. them onto the agenda for our regular team meeting. So they were always there as one of the agenda items. You know, we, we didn't look at them every week when we had the meeting, but, you know, they were there. And people were keeping that list at the forefront of their thinking. You know, yeah, there are five major risks here in our project, even though, you know, risk management is not something that we do generally here in our company. So that's maybe a trick for project managers out there who, who like me, don't have the budget to do a real in-depth risk management management process like you would have on, on some kind of an yeah. aerospace project that that's going on for years. Yeah, that's a good tip. Very yeah. good. I, so uh, I recommend that highly as well. Excellent. So that was number eight. Number seven, uh, back to Bill here, unrealistic budgets. Well, what a great segue from my yeah, not exactly. having a budget to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously one of the core components of project management is budget management. And project managers really do have to get their issues with their budgets in front of their customers and in front of their management as soon as possible. So we see this as a major component of communication is unrealistic budgets and how the project manager chooses us to communicate that lack of budget on their project. Right. And and let me make sure that I get this right. In your book, you address what the project manager is supposed to do in this situation when you get, when you're given an unrealistic budget. Uh, no, I don't know, Bruce. I don't think we do. I think what we do is we give the, the, the readers of our book tools to be able to say, hey, here's how we communicate our budget on our project. Ah, okay. And then the unrealistic part was, you know, is really a communication component. Right. So we're saying if if the project manager is not getting that information up to their stakeholders or their management and saying, hey, this isn't the right budget, we just don't have enough, then um, that they'll be able to resolve it based on that. So we don't actually talk about unrealistic budget per se. We just give the project managers the tools to communicate budget. OK, that at, at least that's one way to address the issue here. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. Getting that information in front of them as soon as possible. Yeah. And being able to 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 have the tools to communicate it yeah. to your stakeholders that that's that's a, a one major step towards yeah. getting a hopefully right. real more realistic budget. 
one of the things on unrealistic budgets is going back to number eight is that that's a risk event that could possibly happen is the budget's not realistic and then they could watch for that particular thing and as it progresses and essentially it's going to get worse uh bring that up to uh upper management or executive management that's a very good comment that's a very good comment i hadn't thought about it that way absolutely budget is a risk on your project well actually Mm -hmm. not having a budget is a risk on your project (laughs) having too much budget may not be a risk but i can see a project that has too much budget right let's move down the line let's move on to number six uh bruce that one's for you again we have here undefined success and undefined closure criteria there's another risk event yeah <laughs> okay if if the success criteria has not been identified at the beginning of the project i mean you're you're really starting a communication breakdown right there mm-hmm. from the very beginning of the project because if the team members and the project manager doesn't understand the criteria necessary, you know, to succeed on a project, there's a large communication gap there, which could lead to failure in the project itself. Yep. This ties very nicely in with, I would say, almost earned value, because one of the first things that you're supposed to be doing with earned value is to define your project scope. And once you have the scope defined at the beginning of the project, it, it's just one more little step to also define, you know, what does success look like? What is a closure criteria on our scope? So I'd say these two uh, are, are probably very much related here. We don't define our scope at the beginning of the project and because we don't define our scope we have no idea what success or closure is going to look like yeah exactly yeah Yeah. exactly yeah well and and talking about closure or closeout in our communication book we identify three closeout tools which identifies the um, identification of the closeout criteria itself and they are formal acceptance uh, document itself and then the user acceptance document and then good old lessons learned and that that lessons learned i've found is very important if you start lessons learned right at the very beginning of the project and keep track of it as you move along through the project because you can take some lessons learned that you're learning on the project so that you don't repeat the same mistake later on in the project rather than waiting to the very end and trying to get the whole team back together again which you never can it's better to do that lessons learned going through the entire project right you know what I find strange between the third and the fourth edition of the Pimbok guide is the fact that um, I'm going out on a limb here. I think in the third edition it says that we have a professional responsibility to perform lessons learned meetings. I think that is yeah. the that is verbatim almost what it says yeah. in there. And in the fourth edition. It doesn't say it anymore. It doesn't. It's not wow. as strict anymore. It doesn't say that this is really something that we need to do. And wow. I, I, I have not had a chance yet to talk to the authors of the the fourth edition Pinbok guide to determine, you know, why did you take that out? Why why are you no longer saying that we have a professional responsibility to to uh, the projects, to the organization, to other project managers in our organization to to hold these lessons learned meetings? I'm, I, I was just surprised that, that that was taken out. Yeah, that's too bad, too, because part of our book, we talk a lot about lessons learned, and we believe strongly that that's such a key component of, of driving a successful project. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're halfway there now. Uh, Number five is uh, lack of stakeholder buy-in. Bill, this is one for you again. Okay. So stakeholders can clearly make or break your project from a communication perspective. So it's really critical that the project managers are communicating the right information to them to allow them to make business decisions. So budget information, scope information, schedule information, just some of the key components of ensuring stakeholders have the information they need to help you with your project success. So we look at that stakeholder buy-in as a really getting them the information to, to drive uh, decisions. Yeah. Well, what's the primary way in which you personally get stakeholder buy-in on your projects, Bill? 
I think it's really working with the stakeholders, um, getting information to them early and often, and just kind of driving. And so I personally sit down with them, go over budget, go over scope, go over resources, and really kind of communicate um, the information to them on a consistent uh, and reliable basis, which means constantly getting them the information for, for them to make those decisions. Okay, okay. Um, moving on to number four, interesting enough, we've we've almost t- discussed this a little earlier when I talked about earned value. Bruce, this one is again for you, number four here, poor project requirements. Mm-hmm. Well, in reality, poor project requirements is really a breakdown in communication of what's required for a success on the project. If you can't get the project requirements, how in the heck are you going to proceed with a good scope, essentially, and then details on on what your project's going to do. Uh, in my experience, uh, poor project requirements is a lack of communicating what those requirements are. In other words, some team member has not gone to the user, the user, not the user, the owner of the project, and sat down with that person and identified what are the project requirements from the owner because the owner is the one that sets those requirements. And if you don't sit down with that owner, you're not going to get those requirements or or you're going to be possibly doing extra work that's not required on the project. Yeah, and again, this ties in with the previous one, the lack of stakeholder buy-in, because Mm -hmm. where do your requirements come from? They come from your stakeholders, right? Because in the end, you as the project manager, you're only supposed to manage and run the project. You're not supposed to say, these are the requirements. You're supposed to go out and talk to your stakeholders and, and get their requirements. And once you have their requirements, then it becomes their project and you've got the buy-in. So that this is kind of, once again, they they go hand in hand. Very much so exactly exactly yeah moving on to one that every single project (laughs) manager in the world knows about here number three the third uh, reason why projects fail unrealistic schedules bill what have you had sure this one? so project schedule management is clearly is one of the key components of project success and it's an area where project managers need to really communicate their schedules throughout the life of the projects when you see or hear that projects are failing due to unrealistic schedules again a major portion of this is around communications meaning if project managers don't communicate the schedule is not possible with the other two constraints the project managers created a communication gap, and that gap will lead to projects failing. So again, this is a, a strictly a communication issue. Yeah, and of course, an uh, unrealistic schedule ties right in with the unrealistic budgets that we've had before, yep. and with the fact that, you know, if if you're given an unrealistic schedule as a project manager, you have to do something. You can't right. just sit there and say, yeah, okay, we're going to try it without making cuts somewhere else. Right. I mean, we have project constraints, the, the, the uh, you know, the traditional uh, triple constraints of budget, schedule, and cost which have now been extended to encompass many more in the new PMBOK guide. They're calling them the uh, competing project constraints. So you're going to have to sit down with your stakeholders, with your owners, and you have to gonna have to tell them, look, this is unrealistic. If we really have to have this schedule as our primary constraint, then we have to cut somewhere else. There's no way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Bill and I, every every once in a while, run simulation uh, essentially what if type of uh, situations and creating in a simulation uh, run a Monte Carlo type simulation on a schedule 99 times out of 100 it will tell you that you don't even have a 50% chance of making the schedule that you're that you're going after (laughs) wow that's that's uh, not surprising but let me ask you this guys unrealistic schedule how many times did you have to push the schedule of publishing your book out (laughs) None. <laughs> literally uh, literally none we we serious? actually were early wow and so basically i i, I wouldn't i'd say we actually had to push it a couple times and and the reason is is because it changed formats a couple times oh, okay so it, when it changed 
uh, it was in the Bible series and out of the Bible series. And when it flipped formats, uh, the schedule actually right. changed. Obviously. I mean, you can't change requirements right. and scope and then expect right. to, to keep the schedule the same. Okay. But every time, but what Bruce was alluding to is every, as good project managers we are, every time they gave us a new schedule, we always came in on time. Ah, so. good. So <laughs> you, you reached yeah. the, the last approved and agreed upon schedule. Right. Good. Yes. Excellent. Every time. Every time. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, we're moving down to number two. We're getting close to, to number one here, and hopefully everybody already knows what number one is all about. I'd be surprised <laughs> if they didn't. So number two, Bruce, this one is for you. Insufficient resource planning. Okay. Again, this, in my opinion, is the communication breakdown in the way resources are going to be used on the project. It's the lack of sitting down with the team and identifying how the project is going to use the types of resources, the skills that they have, and when they're going to be used. Really, it's, it's interesting because even if you go back on any of the, these 10 types of, or other, the nine types of project failures, almost every single one of them has something to do with a communication breakdown, the reason why the uh, unrealistic schedules or poor project requirements, you know, any of those, they all have to do with communication. Right. You know, and, and what we did, they, they came up, well, up, up, well, I'll stop there and then talk about this when we get into communication itself. That is an excellent segue, because if people haven't realized it now, we're now getting to number one, which is, uh, we guessed it, it's poor communications. Yes, poor communications, obviously the number one project killer. Um, I'd, like you, I'd like to hear a little bit from both of you about this. So, Bill, why don't you start out with your thoughts on poor communications as a project killer and then hand it over to Bruce? Well, I think actually it's at the tip of Bruce's tongue right now, so I'm going to let him go first. <laughs> He's all excited, so let him go first. <laughs> my mind is racing and my passion is really up there. <laughs> okay, I, what I was trying to say on this is that if you took every single one of the other eight out of the nine, the other eight uh, reasons for project failures, you could almost identify the fact that they really are a band-aid for poor communication. I mean, take take insuff insufficient resource planning. That's just plain not communicating what those resources are going to be. I would say that's 100% communication. It isn't the fact that they're the the resource is not being planned or I mean it's that fact, but the fact that is the reason why it's not being planned is because of poor communication. They're not communicating that plan, if I make myself clear. I yes. mean I can go through no, each absolutely. one of these. No, absolutely. This yeah. is this is completely clear of what you're trying to say. I, I can completely follow. Bill and I went through and figured out, you know, roughly and of course we're biased, <laughs> but we figured out, okay, that you know, insufficient budgets or something along that line, maybe Maybe that's 50% communication and 50% is really because of insufficient budgets and things like that. So we went through all of these and we came up with a conclusion that the real reason why projects fails isn't the 29% that they said was poor communication. It's more like 85 or 90% of the reasons why projects fail. It's, it's, yes, it is the lack of stakeholder buy-in in a case, but why is the reason the stakeholder isn't buying in? Poor communication. It always boils down to poor, not always, in most cases it boils down to poor communication. Yeah, you probably have a good 80-20 rule, if not more, 90-10 rule here, yeah. where, where poor communications as such here, even though it's just one out of the nine, it's probably 80 to 90 percent the reason why projects fail. Exactly. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book was because the re we sat on a, a local university uh, advisory board, project management advisory board, and Bill and I were w volunteered basically to do the syllabus for the communication por portion of the knowledge areas because mm -hmm. they have to go through all the knowledge areas. And so we said, all right, let's take the communication one. Either that or it was forced on us. We're not sure. <laughs> Can't remember. But when we were doing our research 
in this. It was really interesting because we could outline the communication class. This was for the master's program, master's degree. And and we could easily come up with the subjects and, and what you're supposed to learn in project communication. And then we went and researched the books that were available for project management communication, and there were none. There were zero. There was lots of them on social communication, and there were thousands of them on business communication and this type of thing, but there were none on project management communication. And that's when we looked at each other and said, hey, there's a big gap right here in the project management field, and especially in the training area, so that we decided to sit down and write the book, and four years later, we had it complete. Right. On time, I hear. On time, even. <laughs> and on <laughs> And within budget. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> Bill, do you have anything to add uh, from I your sure... point of view in regards to the poor communications? Yeah, I sure do. Um, and I agree with Bruce. Is that's exactly why we sat down and we wrote the book. Um, and I'm, I run a PMO now at Microsoft. And I have 15 project managers uh, that work for me. And what we're finding is um, the tools that are in the book and the tools that we use from a communication perspective is really helping um, drive uh, the value of our projects. And so I, when the project managers start to use these tools like a project calendar, a communication requirements matrix, it's really taken the poor communications out of, of these projects because there's so many tools coming at our customers and they're seeing great value in these tools. So, Fabulous, fabulous. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the book. Uh, obviously, uh, once again, for people who haven't yet caught up on it, it's called the Project Management Communications Bible. I don't think we've mentioned that so far, have we? So, so no. let's let's make sure that we get the title out there: the Project Management <laughs> Communications Bible, written uh, co-authored by the two of you. And um, uh, tell us a little bit about what people will find in the book, maybe, and uh, and also how it will will help uh, improve communications on their projects. That might be two, two good topics to talk about at this point. Okay. Ah, okay. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> um, well, one of the things, we broke the book really into two major parts. Mm -hmm. And it's the first part of it is what, what I call the soft part of communicating. It's, it's literally the communication one-on-one -on -one or a group or presenting or whatever that, that part of it is. Um, links between communications or how many links you're, you've got between people when you go from two to three to four to five people and, and how you have to communicate and how that communication becomes more complex. And it's that, that first part is more along those lines of virtual, how, how to run and communicate on a virtual project as an example. All of those areas, which I call the kind of the touchy-feely soft part of, of uh, communications. And then we have a second part, which is actually broken into two parts, but that's more on the tools. And part one of that second part is um, basically on how to plan the tools, what, what tools to use, under what uh, knowledge areas that you could use, under uh, what uh, process that you're going to use them, if it's going to be done in the planning process or the initialization process. We've kind of broken out the tools that way, but mostly doing the planning one in that, that middle section. And then the last section takes the tools and shows you how to use them. Mm -hmm. In, in in your various projects. And um, because of this, actually the book itself is, is really uh, not only a, a, a guide for teaching in, you know, both in, in the universities, but it also is a reference manual that you can use as a checklist, basically, like a pilot would go through and check off all the things that he ha has to do before he takes off so he won't forget. Uh, the book acts as the checklist for a project manager saying, okay, I'm in the planning process. Now, what are some of the tools that are being used or that I can use in the planning process and maybe for time planning or for cost planning or for risk planning, you know, these kinds of things. And it's got the various tools under those categories. Right. So, Bill, if I understood you correct, then... Mm -hmm. 
the book is actually something that your project managers in your PMO are using the way that Bruce has just explained it. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. So this works, this works in real life. Oh, well, this is a, mm-hmm. across about 50 <laughs> projects. Yeah, it certainly does. Wow. wow. Cool. So, um, and, and what we're finding is sitting down with our customers and going over these tools and talking to the customers about the tools, they absolutely love it. And so when they have the opportunity to see some of these tools of what they're going to get for the project, it's just, it's just working out really, really well. Excellent. Excellent. Now, I did something before we started the interview that I didn't tell you about, and that is I went onto Twitter and I put out a post on Twitter saying that I'm going to talk to uh, you guys uh, in an interview for the podcast about project communications, and I asked people for questions for you, and I just checked, and I have, in fact, one question that came in uh, from a gentleman called uh, Kulvir Virk. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably totally misspelled or mispronounced your name there. He's from Detroit, and in his bio, he writes that he is the Vice President Communications at PMI GLC, experienced project manager, skilled in development, integration, delivery, and support, creative, positive, solution oriented. And his question to you is the following here Sometimes project communication becomes one way. Do you have any creative ideas on how to get an introverted stakeholder to communicate with you? So this is something here for you to think on your feet. Let me repeat it. Sometimes a project communication becomes one way. Do you have any creative ideas how on how to get an introverted stakeholder to communicate? Who wants to take on this one? So you have an inter- introverted customer that, um, th- so the tip is how to work with an introverted customer and get communications out to them? Yeah, how to get the communication flow going because it's, um, uh, the way I interpret the question is that you are communicating oh. to them, but yeah. there's nothing coming back. How can you make them communicate with you? Yeah, so so that could be a customer, that could be a team member. I think sitting down, the, the where where I would take this is sit down with the customer, explain to them what information you need and why you need it. What's the business value of you getting the information, and how will that drive the project? So uh, even the most introverted person would provide some information if they knew that there was value behind it. And then I would break it down. I'd make it very simple for them, very easy for them. And, and allow them to kind of, you know, work with them to provide you that information. I would do that from a team member perspective or a customer perspective because we, we, we quite run into that on a regular basis anyway when we need information from developers or from testers or architects who may be not so, you know, um, not so used to sharing information. I sit down with them, break it down, tell them what information I need and ask them uh, for that back. So are you telling me that a breakdown in communication is best resolved through appropriate communication? <laughs> yeah, it is. And sitting Good. down, yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for being a good sport here and taking this off-the-air question that really came sure. in live about five minutes ago here from uh, from Kulvir. <laughs> All right. Um, so here is my final question for the two of you. And uh, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like you to open up your bag of tricks here and and give the re- give our listeners something from your book here and uh, tell me what is your favorite tip your favorite communications tip your favorite communications tool maybe from the book and why is that your favorite let's begin with Bruce okay my favorite one <clears throat> as far as a tip is concerned is lessons learned that when doing lessons learned, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, that if you do it each uh, week at the weekly status meeting, you have a few minutes, and it doesn't take long. Just you sit down and you go around each person and ask them if they learned anything this week and then report that, basically jot it down, and then have an administrator summarize that up after the meeting and then maintaining a lessons learned also, during that particular meeting, you would ask everybody, "Is uh, okay, have you seen some things where we can improve as far as some of the things that we've learned? So that, they, that it keeps everybody thinking along the lines of, 
hey, we should be able to do this a little bit better, and there's another lessons learned that you can do. And add to your lessons learned, um, I had to call it a dictionary or, or notebook or whatever you want to call it, document at the end of it. But that's my my tip that I'd like to leave is is do your lessons learned all the way through the project and learn by the the experience that you're having and use it throughout the project rather than waiting at the end of the project because most of the time if you do you've forgotten uh, I'd say 90% of the lessons that could have been learned and uh, and then therefore don't capture them so this way you've got them captured and you've got them uh, completed and at the very end all you have to do is bring that last week's lessons learned uh, into the document and you're done with your lessons learned. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Thank you, Bruce. Bill, what is yours? What is yours? And of course, mm-hmm. you can't select yeah. the same one. You have to give us a different one. <laughs> no. <laughs> We've got lots of tips. So I would highly recommend is to use the two different PMI charts that we put in the appendix. So we built a PMI mm-hmm. chart based on the nine knowledge areas. And we've added the 71 tools to each of those nine knowledge areas. So what are my tools for communication or, um, sorry, for scope management or for cost management? Um, and then we've also created the same um, chart, but we put it into the five life cycle processes. So what are my planning tools? What are my executing tools? What, what are my closeout tools? So I strongly suggest people, especially the PMI diehards, is to take those two charts put them on your office wall and then when you need to communicate scope or time or cost you actually have a series of tools wonderful. you can use to wonderful. communicate thank you. thank you so much so once again yeah. uh, in closing the book is called Project Management Communications Bible and obviously we are going to have a link in the show notes to this book so that interested listeners can just go to the PM Podcast website and click and get the book right there well, Bruce, Bill, thank you so much for your time today. I enjoyed myself tremendously. I learned a lot from you today. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius. And that was our interview with Bruce Taylor and Bill Dow on the top reasons why communications on projects fail and their book, The Project Management Communications Bible. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. At this point, let me again ask you for that one small request. Remember the one that I talked about in the last few episodes? Please go ahead and tell just one person today about the Project Management Podcast. And as you are sending that email to that one person, you can also send an email to me to pmpodcast at gmail.com by December 21st with the subject Bible and enter into the book giveaway for Bruce and Bill's Project Management Communications Bible. As always, you can find us on the web at thepmpodcast.com. If you are a project manager who wants to become a PMP, then the easiest way to do so is with our sister podcast, the Project Management Prepcast, and study for the exam by watching over 38 hours of video training from pmprepcast.com. Please send your emails to pmpodcast at gmail.com and when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this. To the optimist, the glass is half full. To the pessimist, it is half empty. To the project manager, the glass is just twice as big as it needs to be. Until next time.